Welcome to a very special edition of the Champagne Comedy Podcast, where we talk about the best Australian comedy show of the 90s ever made, The Late Show, and other degeneration comedy tidbits. My name is Matt, and joining this podcast today is Alison, Daniel, and Kim. Oh, and they should Hello. be. Hold oh, on, we've got to pay for the applause. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Um, I'm not in the Hello. <laughs> because this is a very, very, very special podcast, I should say. Uh, I'm a bit nervous right now, so I do apologise if I stumble and stammer. Uh, this is a special edition because we have a very special guest. Normally, we would have to get a guest on to do a review of a particular episode, but in this case, we thought we'd do a special chat with <laughs> an actual Late Show cast member, Jason Stevens. Hi, Jason. Yay. Thank you. I got the same applause as you guys did. <laughs> you, know, you could have doubled that up or something. Oh, I'm working on it. Uh, I was going to get Piffy to come in and do his bells, but he's too busy opening up his nightclub slash oh, really? restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is, yeah. So we had him on a podcast a, a few um, episodes ago, and, yeah, yeah, he's a great sport and still rings the bells occasionally. I bet he does. <laughs> <laughs> And he had his baby son introduced to the bell the first time, just that very night. <laughs> oh, take, take me back already. Yeah. So where can we start with this, honestly? Um, I've got a shitload of questions, really, um, but I'm going to leave it open to the floor, really. So uh, I guess I'm going to start with Daniel, really. Um, Daniel, would you – yeah, you can start. Well – I mean, we, we usually ask this of most of our guests who come on the podcast, so we might as well ask it of Jason Stevens. Um, how did you become a fan of The Late Show? <laughs> <laughs> how did I become a fan? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. You know, I got the T-shirt and I, and I got the cap. And, uh, <laughs> I've actually still got the T-shirt and the cap. And I kept it thinking one day I'll, you know, I'll, you know, I'll give it away or, or, or show it to somebody who might be impressed, but uh, it's, it's in mothballs and... Um, it's like my comedy company T-shirt, which I got when I worked in the comedy company as a writer. So, ah, yeah, a couple of days, beautiful. Did you have any <laughs> yeah. contribution to that? Yeah, well, actually, Mick and I, Mick Malloy and myself, um, that was one of our first. We were like a, a writing duo coming out of university, and that was one of our first gigs. Was writing sketch comedy for the comedy company, and we wrote. Um, I don't think we did the the uh, couple of days ones, but we did quite a few sketches. And um, we were working at, at the radio station right next door. So it was, you know, it was, we were doing two gigs writing for the radio station breakfast show and then opening a door and going to the comedy company offices and writing for them. So it was quite a good gig. Wow. Was that the D, the DJ and breakfast show you were writing for? No, it was actually the Fox FM, which was in Melbourne breakfast show. And we were like straight out of uni. And, well, we, you know, we'd done, we did this, this thing called the Melbourne University Review, which, which was basically, you know, um, in the tradition of what the DJ and guys did, Robin and um, Santo and Tom had done it two years previously with Magda Shabansky. And um, we did it two years later and basically took a year off university, piled into a, you know, a small van and um, travelled around Australia doing our sketch comedy show. And that's where we kind of really learnt to write sketch comedy was we were actually performing it and writing it and when things didn't work, we'd rewrite it and perform the next night. And it was kind of really intense but the best sort of apprenticeship you could ever do because you learned how to write sketch comedy on the road and if it didn't work, you wanted to fix it the next night because it was <laughs> you didn't want to have the embarrassment of that sketch dying again. And so when we got back, we, we got offered all these jobs to write, write comedy, which was kind of at that time, in, especially in Melbourne, was booming. And there was, you know, the Jerry Conley show and there was um, the comedy company and, and, and the DGN were doing their show and they, uh, they invited Mick and I to, to join them eventually, which was very, very cool. Well, speaking of early day uh, scenario of your uh, early sketches and bits mm -hmm. and pieces, for your Melbourne Uni review things, I, gotta, I don't have the video clip. I wish I did, actually, now that you mention yeah. it. Uh, can you explain the Fairy Penguins' performance on Red Faces? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was um, – so we, yeah, we've been, as I said, you know, travelling around Australia. Um, we took out a loan, I think it was about $30,000, that our managers 
father had sort of was guarantor for all, right? So we had to pay back the loan at the end of the tour. And, you know, touring's quite expensive, the accommodation and travel, and we were sort of making ends meet, but we weren't going to pay that $30,000 back. So when we got back to Melbourne at the end of the tour, um, we had a, a show that we were doing in Melbourne, and the seats, you know, we were selling okay, but we needed to sort of basically, you know, fill out the theatre for about two weeks to pay off our debts. And somebody came up with the bright idea of doing Red Faces because we thought, you know, great publicity. And back then, there was about 1.5 million people watching Hey Hey on Saturday on Saturday night. It was live. It was one of the biggest shows on television. And so they said, let's do Red Faces. It'll be great publicity. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, this is kind of risky because John Blackman, you know, how Red Faces used to work, John Blackman would sort of talk over the axe and, you know, the gong would come out. So everybody decided the Fairy Penguin sketch was the the best bet and uh, I was a little bit nervous thinking the sketch goes for about four minutes there's no way it will last the four minutes without Blackman or, or somebody going out so we actually we abbreviated the sketch into about I think about 50 seconds and um, I went out I was obviously one of the pe- fairy penguins with Margie Nunn and Paul McCartney being the seagull we went out and uh, did it and it worked really well actually and we won that night and uh, the next day you know we sold out the two weeks the next day. So we sort of paid off our debts and it was a sort of, you know, good news story. So, but that sketch, I mean, you know, you do it at the time and it just keeps coming back. That sketch is like <laughs> every red face is special. <laughs> <laughs> it's on YouTube and it's, anyway, my kids can't believe my hair was ever that black and that long. So. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I will, um, if, if it's uh, okay with everyone else here, I do have a little clip which I will try and play. Fingers crossed that it works. So this is from The Genocide. At last, an album for the entire family. Traditional Australian folk songs. As performed by the Cobram Indoor Cricket Club Chorale. <laughs> including... More beer, more beer. You're a bastard referee. The rousing. And of course, the romantic. Show us your tits. Show us your tits. Show us your tits. All these classics captured on the one big album. Traditional Australian folk songs as performed by the Cobram Indoor Cricket Club Chorale. We'll sing you a song and it won't take long. All coppers are c***ing stubborn. <laughs> Out now on P. So something like that, when you would record a sketch like that, how long would something like that would take back in that day? To record it? Oh, it was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was, I think, part of the D-Generation specials. Is that right on, on Channel 7? Yeah. yeah it was, I think Mick Farlow was in that and, and um, he was part of that, those specials. Um, yeah, pretty quick. I mean, that's the thing about sketch comedy. You didn't have a lot of time to record it. But you sort of, you know, one take and just sort of like bash it out, that sort of stuff, you know. Um, but, yeah, a lot of, lot of long, dark hair, wasn't there, in that sketch? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hey. like, oh, God. Mullets are coming back, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask you what happened after you, you'd you obviously done student comedy and you'd, you'd got into writing and, and the degeneration and then along comes the Channel 9 pilot of The Late Show. Could you tell us what you remember about that? That Yeah, that was, um, well, we were sort of wanting to do a television show. That was, you mean, it was The Late Late Show, I think it was called. Is that right? That pilot? Yeah. So we were given the opportunity by Nine Network to do a pilot. I don't think they knew what they were getting. <laughs> we were sort of, we were, you know, it was, it was basically, you know, a precursor to The Late Show. Um, and in lots of ways we learned what worked and what didn't work through that experience. Um, but it was a similar type of show, you know, and I think we may, I think that's where Shit Scare was born actually. Um, Mick and, and Rob started doing Shit Scared on that nine show. So that we did actually 
you know, it was a good experience in that way that we did, you know, um, it was the birth of a few sketches like that, particularly that one, which was very funny. Um, and we did it for Nine. You know, I guess Nine was one of those networks, even back then it was sort of probably not the most natural home for us. <laughs> and I think uh, they weren't sure what to make of the show. So I can't even remember the politics of it, though. I think it was one of those th- decisions that, you know, people upstairs didn't quite know where to put that show in terms of their programming, you know. So um, it didn't go any further. But then um, we luckily ended up at the ABC, which was, you know, the perfect home in the end. Yeah, Definitely. I think we noticed when we were reviewing the early episodes that some of the closing credits had sketches that we weren't familiar with or that maybe there was some extra footage somewhere that, that we that might, might be hiding. <laughs> I don't know where that stuff is. I mean, Tony Martin, who's kind of like the unofficial curator of the whole, you know, DJ and late show sketches, he would know exactly where it all was. But, um, yeah, it was pretty raw, that show, as I remember it, because it was our first time together doing a show like that. And as I said, it was kind of, it was a good experience in, in, in a, as a bit of a dress rehearsal, I guess, for the ABC show, which was, you know, even those first, I don't know, two or three episodes of The Late Show were pretty, looking back, were pretty raw and took us a while to find our rhythm, like any show, you know. And I think the reviews we got were pretty sort of damning at the beginning of that, uh, that first season. Oh, yeah. We know that they were pretty damning because we do make fun of a few of your very strong cr- critics, like Warnicky. All based on <laughs> Ross Warnicky, if that rings a bell. Oh, yeah, right. Ross Warnicky and, and Robert Fidgen. I think it was quite a few. They were lining up, you know. Fidgen! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're just running jokes in our podcast. So, um, yeah. yeah, and it's at least that with the critics, did that actually help you at all develop um, the, or polish the show a little bit more? Because as the show... Um, went on, uh, the sketches, that the content was, was becoming a lot more stronger. Did it actually or unintentionally help, even though you were reading the um, reviews and going, oh, what does he know, and so forth? You know what? You know, we were so young and sort of, I guess, there's a fair bit of bravado. We actually believed that what we are doing was funny, and if it wasn't funny, we were, I guess the rule was just, you know, <laughs> making each other laugh, but it didn't work. So, I mean, we were kind of... Uh, dismissive, I think, of, of those sorts of reviews. But I mean, we read them and we, you know, I mean, being on the ABC, you, we were a bit protected from that sort of, you know, that criticism that they weren't going to pull, didn't get a sense they're going to pull us off, whether we, that may have happened on a commercial network. But no, we were sort of like just got on with it, really, to be honest. I mean, we sort of, we, we read the reviews and I guess we felt they were older style reviewers and they were of a different world and they didn't kind of get our comedy. That was our sort of, you know, rationale in terms of the criticism. But they, you know, there's probably some truth in what they were saying about those first couple of shows. They were pretty sort of messy and, you know, we were sort of making up some of it as we went along. But, um, yeah, it was pretty savage, as I remember. But it didn't seem to worry us, you know. Oh, I, I can't remember it worrying us. I think we just got on with it, really. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uh, funny you say that about the reviewers sort of being from a different time because I, I remember one of Ross Warnicke's uh, reviews, I think this might have been after the first or second episode, was that he was sort of expecting the late show to be a bit more sort of variety based. Yes. To sort of like have, you know, like the occasional musical number, which, I mean, my my conspiracy theory of that is that that might have been where the toilet break uh, might have uh, <laughs> been born from. You might be right, Daniel. I think Tony Martin probably took that uh, criticism and uh, uh, grabbed that slot. But yeah, I think that's what the ABC's. Saturday night, not Saturday night slot had been, is that more sort of, um, shall we say, a little bit smoother and a bit more sort of, um, you know, jazz hands and uh, <laughs> crooners. And that's not what they were getting with us. Well, you, you certainly connected with a younger generation of people who were not reading Ross Warnicky and, and that. You know, I, I was I was 14 and 15 um, when yeah. I was watching The Late Show and I totally got it. And and all my friends at school totally got it as well. And and that, well, I, I don't know, may, maybe you can comment on this. When did you realise that there was this audience out there that you were building of, I suppose, younger people? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think we'd actually, our demographic, I mean, I've since sort of learnt from people coming up over the years. I mean, you know, so how old were you when you watched that show? And there's looks of people younger than us. Oh, we were 13. Parents said we were allowed to stay up and watch it. And it's like, I think, 
I think 13 and 14 year old teenagers really enjoyed it because it was a bit naughty and a bit sort of, you know, I guess edgy. Um, but, you know, the show rated okay. I mean, it was, it, it would be interesting to see how it would go today in terms of social media. But, um, I mean, I guess the, the thing was we'd go out after the show and, and we'd be out and people would have just stayed home, watched the show and gone out as well. So we'd meet people after the show and they'd be talking about the sketches and how much they loved it. So it was really that sort of immediate sort of response to live TV where we'd sort of go out in Melbourne and talk to people who would tell us how much they loved the show. And, yeah, I mean, I think it was probably, the, you know, it was just a really sort of slow burn in lots of ways. Um and we could only go by the ratings and I guess, you know, people were writing letters to us. I mean, that sounds old fashioned now, but you know, it was, it was, <laughs> there was no social media. Um, I remember us doing a show in Sydney and we sort of flew up and there were fans at the airport, like welcome to Sydney holding sort of, yeah. and, and I thought, well, okay, this is kind of interesting. You know, this is, <laughs> I mean, that was a moment where it felt like, okay, this is like, you know, you know, people are really enjoying it, you know, and enough to come to an airport and hold up a handmade sign to say, you know, welcome to Sydney. But yeah. Had I known when you were be in Sydney, I would have been there with a sign as well. Yeah. <laughs> you say, that was me with that sign. No, we, we're not that obsessed. No, no, we, we were quite obsessed. I think, as Alison said, she was a teenager, about 14, 15. I was similar age as well, 15 yeah. years old. Still technically old enough to, to watch it, so I didn't feel that like I was doing something. Yeah. <laughs> but I was too young to, to go out at night after that and discuss it. But it was definitely one thing that we all talked about in the, in the playground the next week, doing all the ouchy wouchy heart sketches and just reenacting it all as well and recording it and watching it again throughout the week. So there was a little bit of an obsession. And I've got the, um, oh, yes, my Year 11 folder, which is covered with photocopied. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really proof. It. Yes, documentary proof. <laughs> but we, Fantastic. of course, I was unable to um, use the actual actual clippings. I had to photocopy it and put it on my folder because I didn't want to tarnish the originals, of course. Of course, of course yeah. <laughs> so, yes, it was. we were slightly sad. We had no lives. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. it was, it's really amazing um, just to see exactly how much um, people just – quote the show i mean on social media when we've got the, the late show um facebook page just the amount of um feedback you get um that you've got whenever there's a melbourne cup and you bring out the duffel coat supreme meme for example yeah, right. yeah 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 <laughs> i think that sort of stuff you know it wasn't until years later well personally i didn't feel like until years later that you've got a sense of how much of the fans were so into it you know it wasn't one of those you know, i think you either loved it or you didn't sort of know about it but the people who watched it and loved it were so into it and uh, that was i mean that was it was great to sort of see that passion you know and great that people still talk about it today like you guys i mean you know yeah well i was going to say that uh when it does come to uh mainly afl grand final stuff one of the, your particular sketches is um, the grooming school for AFL footballers. Yes, with now, Tim, uh, Tim Watson. Yeah, so I, I'm going to play a clip for you. For AFL footballers, this is Essendon player Tim Watson before he enrolled in the course. Jimmy, you played well last week. Well, all the boys play well. You know, it's really good to get a win under our belt, um, but we're not getting carried away. Uh, you know, if you look at our team, we really are a champion team, not a team of champions. Right, what about the finals? Well, look, we, we can't look that far ahead. You know, really, we've got to take each week as it comes, and, uh, you know, the, the, the finals are a long way off. Right, and will you be playing on again next year? Well, I haven't decided at this stage. Um, you know, I'll sit down with the match committee at the end of the season and, uh, you know, they'll look at the way I've played throughout the year and then, uh, you know, really we'll just have to sit down and decide amongst ourselves. Terrific. Yeah, a bit tragic, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> you must admit you sound like a bit of a dickhead back then. Yeah, I was, I was very disappointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now uh, Tim can safely say that he has escaped the stock standard applies from which all professional footballers suffer. Because of the grooming school for AFL footballers, our graduates learn specific techniques in handling an interview. No cliched responses, no false modesty, and lessons in saying exactly what you think. Tim, you played a great game last week. Good. Uh, I was shit hot last week. Um, <laughs> actually, I've been bloody good since I've come back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just been a little bit disappointed with the way some of the other boys have been. Right. And, um, Timmy, what about the finals? I think he's a rat's ass about the finals. <laughs> 
There's a couple of important things that are going on at the moment. First, I've got to get paid. Right. And, you know, with the way I've been playing, it's never enough. Right. And secondly, um, I'm still organising the players' trip away at the end of the year. Great. And, uh, Timmy, the big question, will you be playing on next year? No, I don't need this bullshit. Um, <laughs> no, I'd much rather get back up there in the commentary box with, um, you know, Dennis and Bruce and the boys and right. chew on donuts and, uh, you know, hang, hang shit on the blacks who are playing today. Great, Timmy. Now, with uh, something like that, when you're trying to get a particular player or someone to play along with your actual sketch, uh, and did you have any issues with anyone not trying to play along or just not getting your actual sketch of what you had produced? Uh, I, no, mostly, you know, like Tim Watson is such a lovely guy and he was, I think, a fan of the show. He, I think we knew him actually from Channel 7 days and... Uh, he totally got it. He got on and he, he understood it. And then we did things where we had people on um, as guests. And I think I think mostly they all, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't be on the show if they didn't understand the humour of, of our show. So they all played along brilliantly, you know. And I think also they're, they're, if they're of that age, their kids would tell them to get on the show because it was very cool <laughs> to do it. <you> know? <laughs> like Joan Kern and people like that. Um but we had, yeah, we had some great people on the show and they all just, you know, celebrated the, the, the comedy and the humour. It was fantastic. Did you find after the second, when the second season started that you had more interest? There were, there seemed to be bigger names, celebrities, not to say that there weren't any in season one, but it just seemed like there was a lot more budget and a lot more kind of famous stuff, except, especially at the end when, they, when you had your um, little finales. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. The second series was so much easier to get people on. You know, everybody was on board by that stage. Because um, we did that song at the end of the, I think it was the second series that we did that sort of musical, mm -hmm. we used to call them. Yeah. yeah. And that was getting Ron Brassy and Rex Hunt and, um, oh, we had all sorts yeah. of people. They all sort of, if they, if they didn't know about the show, I think somebody close to them would have told them, you know, it's worth doing. And they all came on and, um, yeah, Don Lane did the show and, Oh, oh, fantastic, you know, fantastic. Yeah, we recently spoke to Gabriel Gatte about his time being on it, performing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. absolutely had a ball. He said he actually was having a singing coach trying to make sure that he can uh, <laughs> say uh, the, the proper English language but as well as keeping his authentic <laughs> French uh, accent with it. But he said that it was like he loved reminiscing about it and he does get asked about it a fair bit, so... Uh, yeah, he, he, he said yeah. he, he had a great time doing it. Yeah, well, I think Joan Kerner, um, she did it again, I think, uh, at an ALP sort of fundraiser later on that year, you know. <laughs> um, with the, I think Julia Gillard was on stage with it for that fundraiser. But uh, It's a very infamous photo, that one of, of Kerner and Gillard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It goes yeah, around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, yeah, it was a really good idea, actually, um, those musical mix-ups. Uh, you also uh, collaborated a lot with uh, Philip Brady. Like uh, he was on often enough on the late show to sort of be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to sort of be the ninth member of the cast, just about. Um, yeah. As, uh, like, he was especially used a lot on muck raking as well. Yeah, well, he sort of, I guess, represented that you know era of television where you know, which you know, Bert and, and Philip Brady and. Um, you know, all those guys, you know, basically they started variety in Australia, you know, with, with what they were doing. And, and Philip, um, I mean, as Bert did, they all sort of enjoyed our show because I think it sort of reminded them of what they did in lots of ways, where it was kind of, it was live, you know, we were sort of um, a bit sort of cheeky and irreverent and um, we were having fun and I think Philip Brady sort of recognised that and he'd come on and he just, you know, um, Pete Smith obviously was another one. they just play with us, I think, you know, and they were of that generation where they sort of really enjoyed, I think, being invited. But um, we had great collaborations with, with um, Phil and um, and Pete Smith and uh, years later I did a, um, a telly movie called The King, which was based on Graham Kennedy, which I produced. And... Uh, <laughs> We, Matt's holding up the DVD. There we go. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So we actually his, filmed. His, his, some of that. his help contribute to your salary. There. <laughs> yeah, nice. um, so we recreated the Graham Kennedy in Melbourne Tonight um, um, TV set in the same studio that we shot the Late Show. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, which is very cool. You know, personally, it's like 
my, my career sort of like, you know, come back to, to Rip and Lee, um, to Studio 31. But we got uh, Phil Brady in to, you know, where we were filming um, Stephen Curry playing uh, Graham Kennedy and Stephen Hall playing Bert Newton. We got, we invited him in, um, Phil Brady, uh, and Bruce Mansfield actually. And, um, yeah, Phil Brady was, it was quite a special moment. Was he, he came on set just to check it out because he'd been around during those days at GV9 and he got really quite emotional because he said it was so, it just took him straight back to those days at IMT. And, uh, that, yeah, so I hadn't seen him since, since then. So it was, I think we did the King in 2007. So we sort of, um, I invited him, you know, basically just to come along and have a look. And, um, yeah, he loved that day and he was talking about the late show and it was great, great to reminisce. Can I ask you what a typical production cycle was for episodes of the late show? I mean, how how, how many weeks ahead are you filming stuff and preparing? Yeah, we would we would sort of, we would bank some stuff. So we'd do some stuff in pre-production, which is, which is the time, you know, before you start shooting to actually bank some sketches where we'd write things and produce them ourselves. So we did a lot of sort of filming ourselves. Santo Chilara would do a lot of actually physically filming the sketches and we'd edit them and we'd have those up our sleeve for the uh, series. Um, but not a lot of stuff, but, you know, some things we could always fall back on, I guess. Uh, and then once the show would start, it was a pretty hectic pace because, you know, we'd like to keep the show fairly, you know, semi-topical. So we'd like to respond to things that was happening in the news. Um, and so that meant there was lots of sort of space to fill each week. And a typical week would be, you know, we'd do the show on a, I guess, you know, you do the show on a Saturday night. Um, Mick and I would go out Saturday night and come, come home Sunday morning sometime. <laughs> and Monday come in pretty sort of, you know, slow. But um, we'd meet, I think, on a Monday, you know, we'd sort of, you know, talk about some ideas that we might do. Then we'd sort of splinter off pretty much for the next two days and uh, develop those ideas. But we'd have like each second week, except I think each second week we did muckraking. So we knew we had that slot to fill every second week. So Mick and I, for example, on that week would go to his place on a Thursday night know that you know within 48 hours we're doing something live around australia and go okay what are we going to do this week and you know sometimes it just wasn't there there was no ideas <laughs> but we'd sort of come up with something and then sort of you know develop it on the friday and then basically do the dress rehearsal uh saturday afternoon and then straight into the show saturday night so you know yeah that was sort of that was a sort of pace of it which was quite hectic um in terms of you know, we had lots of ideas each week and lots of segments. So once we were in our 20, I think it was a 20-week run, it didn't slow down. You know, it was pretty full on. But there was lots of us and there's lots of ideas and, um, you know, we got through it. But, you know, the good thing about live TV, once you've done it, regardless of how it's gone, it's kind of, it, you know, you feel like you've done it, it's gone, you, and you move on. Um, of course, these days it kind of comes back to you to haunt you on YouTube, which was <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't around yeah. when we did it. You know, the thought that somebody might be watching this all those years later um, would have been horrifying at the time because you know you go, "Well, that didn't work as well as I thought." Nobody else will watch it, you know, unless they record on their VHS. But uh, otherwise, <laughs> we're yeah. all guilty as charged there. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So speaking of which, we uh, recently, uh, at the time of this recording of this podcast, obviously, uh, we had just recently reviewed uh, Season 2, Episode 8. Uh, was it 9? Oh, either way, it was one of them. Not 9 was the last episode. Okay, yeah. So, uh, but there's, there's a segment of muckraking. Um, mm. this, so this was from Season 2, Episode 8, where uh, you and Mick were talking about, um, you are reflecting on a TV Week magazine that had, Ben Oxenbold and uh, it was Rachel Beck you know, reflecting on their love and you and Mick were taking the piss out of it. Now this, you had a montage, you had a little clip and both Daniel uh, triggered the moment and then we're all going, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, the clip was obviously you had all, everything from season two, you, were do, you could do random little bits and pieces, but there was one clip from season one in particular and we're going, we have not seen that. So yeah, all, all this stuff you can see, it's, it's the home set, that was from season one, back to season two. And then, I think coming up here, you can see 
the season one set, which is all Grant and Blues. Oh, come on, where is it? There. Yeah. Here we are. And we're wondering what the hell is going on there. Basically, a bunch of sheep uh, running through the season one set. Then. Of, um, I can't remember. That's a really good pickup. I mean, I, I mean, the fact that there's a lot of sheep, unless it was something that we filmed and never used, like I, I'm really sort of intrigued to know what it might have been. Well, yeah, it's, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't get seen anywhere else in the series. I think we might. What, what we may have done is like we would have known that we were doing a montage, and let's just do like five second things. I think that's what it might have been. We were just like, let's just do stuff where people go, oh, wow, that must have been an amazing sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wish I'd seen that. And I, I think we would have said, well, yeah, it would have been something like, let's get some sheep in the studio and that would show people, you know, it's like an impression of what that sketch may have been about. And, uh, okay. yeah, I think it was that. I think it was just let's get some big props in or some sort of, yeah, live animals, and uh, it will give the impression that we've had some much bigger moments in the show than our budget could afford. Yeah, <laughs> some some weird random shit. Exactly, exactly. Just throw some stuff in there. Because yeah, there was there was sort of a, a similar sort of a thing used for the final episode. Um, yeah, where there were all these like again a slow down montage, but again all of these moments that never happened, like yeah, cele- like celebrating the thirty seventh show. Yeah, exactly. That's what it would have been in that sort of vein, I think. Yeah. But you know what? I can't remember. I don't know why I can't remember, but I, but I can't remember what <laughs> who brought the sheep into Studio 31 and how that all worked. <laughs> <laughs> Just for that little snippet. That, yeah. I mean, I mean you know, on an ABC budget for all things. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, can't, I mean, yeah, it would have been kind of a funny request <laughs> to say, can we bring some sheep in on a Saturday afternoon during dress rehearsal to shoot it? Because all that stuff would have been shot that night, you know, early in the afternoon. Was there anything that the ABC said no to, just in that regard? No, they were pretty good. You know, we, we were sort of, yeah, no, we were pretty good. I mean, we were, Michael Hirsch did a great job of protecting us from, you know, upstairs but, um, you know, I don't think we could make that show today, for example. Um, there was no sort of editorial policy that I remember where, I mean, I think the lawyers, the defamation lawyers would look at the show before it went out in terms of that the sitting, you know, on the dress rehearsal and they'd tell us if there was anything that we couldn't say in terms of defamation. But I can't remember changing anything or I can't remember, you know, any defamation lawyer telling us not to do things. I'm sure there were, um, but, yeah, we were given a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom. I think with defamation, though, we were sort of hiding, but there's a, there's a defensive satire. I think we, we hid behind that most of the time. I mean, are, we, are the rules – sorry, I was going to ask, are the, are the rules different these days? You know, do, do, you, do, do, you, do you have to be a lot more careful around political content, for example? Oh, yeah, I think any comedian would tell you. Not so much legally, but, you know, in terms of being cancelled, I think you have to be very careful, and, and, you know, for good reason too most of the time. But, um, yeah, I think it's very different for people to to create comedy now, especially live when you don't always know, you know, how things are going to be said or, or taken. So, um, yeah, I think the legals are pretty much the same, but definitely in terms of, um, you know, what the public expects is, is very different. Uh, well, speaking of live moments, um, there was one unexpected moment, and I suppose it would have been inevitable considering that Mick Mulloy was jumping up and down in his underpants on other people's TV shows. There was a stage invader at one stage who tried to do the same on The Late Show. Yeah, um, I've forgotten about that. I'm trying to remember... Yes, he, he he tried to jump up and down on one of the couches, but it sort of slid off the the platform yeah. stage, and he ended up just having to jump up and down on the spot. Really, I don't know. I do remember that what happened, and um, but I'm just trying to remember what it was about. I think it was just a guy sort of. Would he been sort of, you know, it was like a dare or something. 
Well, I think I think yeah, because Mick had been doing it on other shows. Right. Yeah, I, like people were trying to do it on yours. Yes, fantastic. So, and and I mean, it was it was yeah, obvious. It, it, it was sport. it was obvious. Like as soon as it happened, that it wasn't like a stage plant or anything. No, no, I remember it happening and it just being a bit awkward, not particularly funny, and. Um, yeah, I think they sort of, I don't even know how they got him off stage. I think we did have security get him off stage, but uh, it was just a bit weird. It's interesting, that episode, because throughout the show, they keep referring back to this guy and, no, you know, it's... It, yeah, it sounds like, you know, there are a lot of stern conversations backstage, like, you know, producers or someone in the ABC accusing them of, of having this guy on and not telling them, not planning it as part of the show or, or something like that. It, it, it must have caused a lot of consternation. Do you remember any of the conversations around this happening? I don't actually, no, I don't. But uh, I do remember that we actually got a good view of it, view of it but um, I don't know how much of it you saw or, at home, you probably didn't see. A, you saw a bit of it, but we saw everything. And he came on, and it was a bit of a tussle, being off and stuff. But um, I think a bit of, I think it just threw us a bit, you know, because it was the last thing you expect on your live TV. And the audiences were great, you know. The audience was, it was a, it was everybody there had applied for tickets, and we were, by that stage, you know, it was oversubscribed. People were like, you know, to get a ticket to the Late Show was a big deal. So people who were there were really into it. So to, for that to happen, it didn't feel like one of the audience members. It felt like somebody had intruded. So it just threw us a bit. Um, but I don't remember anything in terms of upstairs and what they thought of it other than we just went, oh, that was a bit weird. With um, staff that you have worked with, uh, say you, you guys are, in fact, the whole cast made mm. stars out of the floor managers or props like Alf Camilleri yeah. and... Dr. Aaron Boquet. Yeah. Um, I'm going to play you a snippet of um, muck raking where it was all, the topic was all about, about too much violence on TV. This right, uh, you are a lecturer from the University of Michigan. That's correct. And you're currently out in Australia at the moment doing a series of lectures on media studies. That's right. Right. Yeah, okay. You would have been following this debate in the media about uh, violence on television? Oh, very closely. In right, fact, yeah. it's um, a subject most people have very strong opinions about. Right, right. Well, you've seen a bit of Australian television. How would you rate Australian television? Oh, uh, violent, but uh, no more than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. OK, if I could just stop you there, Doctor. We've got a few clips from that. Well, one clip from our show I'd like to show you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can ask... Oh, let's have a look at it here, Doctor. And tell, tell us if you think this is violent, yeah. maybe. Yeah. OK! <laughs> Expert opinion, have someone overstepped the line here? I think I find that very particularly violent. Oh, particularly right. violent? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm still a little confused, Mick. Doctor, if you can clear this up for me. How do you define a, a violent act? I mean, would you consider that <laughs> a violent act? Would that, would that be violent in, in your sort of definition? No, 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 no. settle down, everyone, because Jace has raised a pertinent point yeah. here. How far, no, I'm serious, how far can you go before you just step over the line? For example, would you say that? <laughs> Wrong I see that more in terms of aggressiveness. Yeah. Oh. If you're talking violence, I mean, this is a violent act. That's violent. That is violent. Now I'm with you. Yes. So say something uh, in the terrain of say. That would be violent. That would be violent. I'm getting the hang of this, Jace. Okay. <laughs> what, could go, what could go wrong? <laughs> now, a, um, what was it like to work with Aaron and also uh, having fun with props, right? Uh, so how uh, long would it have taken to actually make sure that that goes okay, you don't actually burn his skin or anything like that? Yeah, he was fantastic. He was he lived up at uh, Mount Nasset and up at... Um, in Victoria and he was, you know, he was one of those guys who'd, who'd make his own stuff, you know, he sort of, he was a hands-on sort of special effects guys and we had complete confidence in what, everything he did. 
But that particular sketch, I remember we did it during dress rehearsal and because we couldn't light things and we couldn't actually go through with all the sort of stunts, I remember just dying in, in front of the, all the crew during dress rehearsals and was like, my God, is this going to work? Because you know, obviously we couldn't go through with stuff so people couldn't see how, how it was going to work. But on the night, it, it worked quite well. You can see me sort of fiddling for the lighter because I knew I had to sort of light the gas thing to light his arm. So I was like, oh, where's that lighter and stuff? But, um, yeah, he was great, Aaron. And, like, you know, I mean, God, talk about different times. I mean, could you do that today? Like <laughs> TV with two guys who didn't really know what they were doing. <laughs> and did, did you all collectively come up with the ideas? Did Aaron sometimes say, oh, this is a, a great kind of thing that you can do? Or who kind yeah, of Yeah, we were taking, we'd probably, I think in that case, we took an idea of what we could get away with. What could we do in a studio? And he'd come up with, well, you can do this, this, and this. And he'd say, look, you know, I'm happy for you guys <laughs> to just. Just sort of set me a light. It's like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, guys, you can do that. No worries. That's easy. We can do that. So, uh, we'd, yeah, we'd come, we'd come to him with a basic premise and say, okay, what what can we do, you know, in terms of the, the bottles and the, the the coffee table and then the lighting, of course. But, um, yeah, he was wonderful. And, you know, I mean, as Alf was, and, and I guess that was, you know, a cue we took from things like Graham Kennedy and Hey Hey, where the crew became part of the sort of family and we sort of referred to them and they became part of the, the whole show, really. It seemed like in the, second se- in the second season there were there was much bigger money to throw at the show and, and things just got bigger. There were bigger explosions and bigger things happening. Is that... Is yeah, that- I think we just got, you know, I think that was also confidence. We really had a, you know, that we had a bit of a, I guess, a sort of, wind in our sails for the second season. I mean, the first season, you know, it was off to a little bit of a rocky start in terms, in terms of finding our rhythm, which is, you know, always the case with first seasons. And then we had a gap between the first and second seasons and we sort of really grew in confidence in terms of what what we could do and what, you know, we were good at. And, and you know, so we went to the second season feeling really good about, you know, the show and, and pushing things. And, you know, I think, I don't re- remember there being any more money, but I think we were just probably better prepared and we sort of, our ideas were better honed, I think, you know, just sharpened. And, um, yeah, it was, I think the second season, I don't know what you guys think, but probably a much better season I'd imagine. There is a bit of a difference between the two seasons in, in my opinion. Yeah. I think we just got better before we became better performers and better confidence and ideas. And I think, you know, it wasn't just the sketches for that show. It was kind of the, collegiate nature of us, I think, you know, working as a group and the audience responding to the fact that we're having a lot of fun and I think we were probably having more fun or, or, or we presented that in the second season and people went with that, you know. That, I think that was the success of the show. It wasn't just the sketches. It was about the fact that we – it was a real wink to the audience, you know, that do you want to come for the ride? We're sort of doing the show. Some things work, some things don't work, but we don't really care if they don't work because we're having fun. You know, that was the sort of sense of the the show and the attitude that we sort of would present. And I think the second season really nailed that, I think, in terms of us hitting our straps. You, you had an additional cast member as well in the, the second series. How did, how did you bring Judith on and, and what did what did she sort of bring to the show, do you think? Yeah, well, that was, I mean, it was looking back, it was pretty hard for Jude because we'd been working together for quite some time before the late show with the, you know, the Channel 9 special and the, the DJ specials and, and of course, on radio um, for quite a few years on Breakfast Radio and Triple M. So Jude came into the group, you know, not having that experience of working with us. I can't remember whose idea it was to bring her in, but it was a good idea because it was just James, any female, and I think, you know, obviously we, we needed another, at least another woman, and Jude was, you know, had such a successful stand-up career, and she came in, you know, fully formed. She had a, you know, she was, she brought something completely different to the to the team that, you know, in terms of her voice. Um, and I don't think, you know, I think it took her, I mean, you know, like in any new group, you know, you have to sort of find your way, but she was... You know, she was such a sure bet in terms of that stand-up, those stand-up pieces she'd do on stage and her ideas. And, um, yeah, she was terrific, really, really, I mean, obviously, you know, great performer. And as I said, something very different to the rest of the team in terms of what she brought to the whole show. 
Yeah, just on that, um, as teenage viewers, we kind of tended to label people, just even yeah. if they were true or not. We used to say Tony's the nerdy one, and yeah. Tom was described as avuncular in the Who Weekly article, which I think um, he'd never heard himself <laughs> described as that before. That's how he found out what it meant. Um, and Mick was the kind of unshaven, kind of sexy one, and so on. Did you have a role? Uh, were our descriptions accurate in any sort of way? Because <laughs> did you have a particular kind of um, identity on the show? How did you fit in? I don't know, actually. I don't know what my persona was. I mean, I, I really, you know, um, I think the thing I loved about the show was just working as a team. I mean, I, I've never been in a band. It was kind of, I imagine what it was like being in a, in a band, you know, in terms of I've always liked collaborating and, you know, I've now ended up as a producer, which I think is a role where you basically it's the ultimate collaboration of bringing people together and, you know, choosing who should do which job. So I think that's kind of was always there for me and I that was the thing I loved about the show was the sort of, you know, I would write things and go, well, you know, I probably think Rob's the best person to do that. I wasn't writing stuff for myself necessarily. Maybe muckraking was a different sort of, was a segment where Mick and I would write stuff for ourselves. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think, I think it was one of those shows where everybody played their part, you know, in terms of what they brought to the, to the, to the group. And, you know, some, it's just that, you know, I guess that's part of the success was that we all sort of, you know, brought different things. Um, Mick's persona as the unshaven sort of cheeky one was pretty much spot on. But Mick, you know, I mean, I met him when he was, I don't know, 19, 20. So we sort of, came through the ranks together and he, you know, he came fully formed, Mick. He was always like that. He, his persona was always that strong, you know, as it is today. So, um, yeah, he hasn't changed much. He, he was, you know, imagine but travelling around Australia with him for a year. I mean, it was hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. We had the best time. Well, you were in a double act, weren't you, you and, you and Mick? Well, well, in that show, we sort of, there was about five of us in that show that, you know, that university review that we took around Australia. But um, we, we wrote together. So we were like always writing together. So when we came, we were invited to the DGN as it is sort of, you know, together. So, um, yeah, I guess we sort of learned the craft of writing sketch comedy together. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you get any very negative feedback from many of the targets that, that you and Mick uh, took aim at on muckraking, like on TV or even when you were doing it previously on, on radio? Oh, not directly. Occasionally we hear back from people like friends of theirs or something or, you know, um, yeah. I mean, the, the weirdest thing was that, you know, when we were on radio, we sort of, we sort of got stuck into Sophie Lee who was trying to, um, she was doing, I don't know, is she doing a singing? Is she starting a singing career? Anyway, we, I think Mick and I did some stuff around her and um, years later Mick met her and they started going out. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've been a girlfriend for a number of years and uh, I never sort of broached with Mick. was like, have you ever had that conversation about, you know, that time we sent, we sent her off? But, you know, we, I just didn't go there. I thought they must have had the conversation or they've moved on. Or <laughs> but, uh, no, no, um, most people took it very well, I think. Um yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was always delivered in the in, I guess in, in the sense of, you know, with a good spirit. But um, yeah, no, we never sort of got any. I can't remember getting any direct sort of people ringing up or, or waking up the horse's head in my bed or anything like that. <laughs> uh, there, there wasn't uh, anything from Joe Bailey or Sale of the Century because you held quite a big rally outside of uh, yeah, no. GTV. No, no, and I've bumped into her, or, or not bumped into her, but sort of like avoided her a couple of times <laughs> in the year. Yeah, yeah. Or she's in the room and like, a, um, but uh, and I've got mutual friends who who remind me of that sketch and say, "Do you want to come over and meet her and talk about that sketch?" It's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that tonight. Um, <laughs> no, I think well, she hadn't she been axed, so I think she was. Yeah, there was there was, a, there was this, this sort of weird. I think it might have been a small running gag that that you were both infatuated with with. John Bailey, and then yeah, she she got the sack from sale, and then all of a sudden you're organising this big bring back Joe Bailey rally. How, yeah. how did that come about? Oh, it was one of those things, you know. Um, again, you know, talking about the show being semi-topical, where it happened, and we decided that you know that'd be a fun thing to do, and you know, we basically that was a typical you know sketch idea which we you know made on the run, where we just basically thought of that idea, wrote it, and then just raced out to Channel Nine and organised, you know, some extras to turn out with placards. 
I think we may have told Channel 9 that we're doing it. We couldn't go in, you know, into their premises, but we sort of hung her out on the other side of the boom gate. I think we may have given them the warning that we're doing it, but it was kind of quite sort of, you know, I mean, that was the pace of the show. We just, you know, turn up and film and hope for the best, you know. Uh, ask, ask for forgiveness later. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, and even, the, you know, I don't know if you remember that Sale of the Century sketch. Hmm. You know, we, we actually did that outside Shell 9 at night, you know, um, in a van. Oh, yes, the uh, uh, when Jane was on the, the comedy uh, special tournament. So, yeah. yeah. That, 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 was, that was quite good too, yeah. Yeah, that was one of my favourite sketches, I think, because it was one of those sketches that we did and we're hoping that it would cut together well, but in post it just it was so much fun putting those, those you know, the real footage with the fake footage that we'd created and it was just like it's one of those ideas that came alive in post. It's like, oh, this is working so well. This is going to be good. Well, see, also, also uh, similar to, you know, Bajas and the olden days, it's one yeah. of those writing techniques where you sort of have to work backwards from the episode of Sale that was broadcast, so... Yeah. It's sort of, it's, it's, it's an interesting writing technique. Yeah. And that sketch actually was a little trick we used to play on ourselves. Not a trick, but we'd, we'd so that Joe Barley sketch, we'd edit it and nobody had seen it except Nick and myself um, in terms of the cast members, other cast members. So we would show it and they would see it for the first time live on the night with you guys because we didn't want to spoil that, I guess, reaction that you could only get the first time when something's played fresh. Yeah, there's there's nothing worse than a, a the fake laugh reaction sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd often do that. We'd we'd have things up our sleeve and show it to everybody on on the couch or on the set for the first time as well. You know, to get that response, which was a really good idea. Well, I was going to say there. Someone had posted um, the actual episode, and while watching it, you know, I discovered why Jane had actually said pumpadums. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, right. yeah, and so it, it kind of it was great to watch, but then it kind of undid the whole joke that yeah. did the set up for it. So it ruined it. it unintentionally oh, yeah. ruined it. Yeah. No, you don't want to ever watch the, the real episode. It's like no, no, no. It just happened that way. Yeah. So yeah. that's very, very clever writing. So the the fact that mm -hmm. you guys did that and it to us it came off very, very smoothly and one of the most oh. memorable. Papa Dumbs is pretty easy to back engineer the joke, I think. <laughs> we, were, we were swooling through what her answers were. It was like, she said Papa Dumbs. Like, oh my God, okay, that's comedy gold. We can come up with a, a joke for that. But, um, you know, Tony Barber was another person who, you know, played along and mm. Paul Cronin and Molly Meldrum and all of these people who, you know, we'd give them a call and organize it. And yeah, they'd always be up for it, you know. It's fantastic. When it came to music parodies, song parodies, mm. um, now, I'm going to play one in particular. That is a highly popular comedy, oh, a sketch, a parody. Uh, in fact, a lot of the, especially when you go on YouTube, a lot of the Late Show song parodies get more views and clicks than the actual song itself. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The better than the original, that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I, I could go on, on and on in regards to yeah. what you've covered, but that one in particular the, the attention to detail, so like the, the fiberglass base and just yeah. the, the layout itself, 
Um, did you actually approach the sharp at all for it? And um, and also, no, no. well, I just I wrote that one. I saw that clip and just wrote that song pretty quickly because I thought, you know, at the time, skivvies were nobody ever wore skivvies. You know, it's like, oh, these three guys in skivvies. So it's like skivvies are back, and that was like, great, that's the song. And uh, and then you know, with music parodies. You know, legally, you've got to do something which is a, what I call a sound alike. So it can't be like the original, but it has to be a little bit different enough to the original. But I actually think the version that we came up with was a better song. So I just, <laughs> yeah, I certainly remember that one better than the other one. Not to say that yeah, the yeah. sharp song yeah. wasn't good, but yeah, this one is got exactly. more staying power. It's pretty simple to copy because there's only like three cut, three members in the band, and um, I do remember that double bass, which I think was. I don't know if it was a real double bass. It was a prop one, but it was so heavy. And I we did like, I don't know. It was like, in the end, it was just like, this is getting really heavy. And um, Rob and Santo loved, you know, they just sort of hamming it up in the background. But it was, we never asked for permission. And I think the guys took it in the right spirit, you know. We never, I think we may, I think we may have heard back years later they enjoyed it. But, I mean, you know, who knows at the time. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Hit song and there's it. a th- there's a chance that Matt might be trying to get in contact with the sharp to try and find out their side of the oh, be their, their, their their reaction. <laughs> yeah, I've well, got- you know, enough time has passed, so hopefully they're not. You know, they, they took it well, but um, yeah, no, I do get asked about that sketch a lot, which is a good is a good one, nice and short too. Yeah, well, I was going to say we have asked uh, Angie Hart for for Frente. Um, yeah, well. she originally had said that. At the time, she was a bit cut up about it, uh, but the rest of the band members were going, oh, yeah, it's cool, but now she freaking loves it, as well oh, cool. as, um, what's his name, the lead singer of Things in Stone and Wood, Greg Arnold. And yeah. he, uh, the first yeah. thing I asked him, he goes, uh, he loved it, like, from day dot, and oh, yeah. he loves oh. being asked about it all the time. Oh, good. I guess it depends on the lyrics, right? Skibbies are back. It's hardly, it wasn't even about the band. It was just about what they were wearing. Yeah. But, uh I do remember the Frente one may have been a little bit more cutting, I think. I can't remember the lyrics, but uh, it may have been a bit more personal, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah a bit more. It accidentally was released as fairly condemnatory, I suppose. Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for reminding me. And she was, you know, she was such a young singer back then too, I think. It sounds like that the Late Show, well, you guys always used a one vocal, one person to sing a lot of the vocals for it. Um, yeah. who, who in particular is saying, well, Skivvies are back? Because that sounds very familiar to a B as the actual singer itself in a lot of the songs. This is a question for Tony Martin. I can't remember. Uh, it's terrible, but I can't remember his name. But we did have somebody who um, would you know, produce the sound of likes and then uh, I think a singer would come in. Not always the same singer, but uh, in that case, I can't remember them name of the guy i'm sorry but uh, most of the music was done by a man named craig harness it was craig of course craig would do the music of course craig uh had a but, uh, like um, i'm sure he, he would have assembled other people to yeah get sound well get people who sound like the people that are being parodied yeah i don't know if craig sang skibbies the back he would sing some things he'd actually produce the songs the sound alikes um in this sort of one man studio um but he would get people in occasionally to to sing songs that's you know to that we would lip sync. I think mostly we lip synced all the songs um, because you know it was just a lot easier, you know, and, and none of us could sing particularly well except for Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to mention, and I'm going to go back a bit further, but uh, that it was, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Was it wasn't five in a row, uh, especially yeah. John Farnham. That wasn't that Jack Jones or. Uh, Irwin, um, what's his Jack name? Jones, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was Jack Southern Jones, Sons, yeah. Yes, it was Jack Jones who did that song, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we did two of those, didn't we? Five more in a row, five in a row and five more in a row. And you did Michael Hutchins. I did Hutchins, that's right. And um, then we did a film clip with John Farnham years later too, but one of his songs that he was releasing yeah, seemed like a good idea at the time. Yes, so he was. Yeah, he was always a big fan of the show, and um, I think uh, his manager Wheatley asked us to sort of, come up with a concept of us sort of helping him put this song out. Yeah, it was a cool day. Yeah, you're all about the moustaches, the false moustaches. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that, that was around the time that um, he was on the show singing the Sandhurst Machinery jingle, I think. Oh, I don't remember that. What was that? 
that, that well, was, you don't uh, remember Sandhurst. Oh, God. <laughs> Sandhurst. <laughs> that, that wasn't his second one. There's everything in no, the for. You guys have seen the show more than I have because yeah. I, <laughs> so I did the show and then I would like do the next show. You guys got to watch it over and over again. But I do, I kind of remember it, but. Um, was it- to, be, to, to be fair, it was <laughs> under commercial crime stoppers, which was yeah. Nick and oh, Right, yes. Yeah. I was probably at the back changing to something for the next script. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't suppose you've, you've got that to play, have you, Matt? Uh, not the video, but I've got the audio. Do you want the original or the John Farnham version? I think the Farnham version. Yeah. All right, it's only a short, <laughs> short snippet. Sandhurst machine. <laughs> oh, God, he made that sound good as well, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that voice. Yeah, amazing. That's great, yeah. I mean, we're so lucky to have all those people come on the show and play along. One of my favourite sketches was from the first season, the Viking talk. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. When the big horns are still in, and, yes. I, and that was I. I just like these little, and there was like talking crap and these kind of just these little funny sketches that didn't necessarily have to do with something topical. Um, yeah. Are there are there any any favourites for you? Uh, was it the, the Viking one where we all sang a song at the end of it? Is that the one? Yes. Or Viking talk. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, any time we sort of got to dress up together and do things like that. Um, on New York, New York was fun, you know, because oh, yes. that was a fun, that was an idea I came up with. I remember ringing up Mick and Tony and just saying, I've got this idea. I think I rang up Tony and said, I said, I've got this idea. you know, this, Tony's such a big film buff. I said, you remember that film, you know, um, on the town with, um, I can't remember who's in it, Gene Kelly and stuff. He said, of course. I said, I think we should do that. You, me and me, just dress up in sailor costumes and run around Melbourne for a day. And he's like, yep, that's great. I'm in. And, I mean, there was only one joke to that idea, which was basically, you know, we were actually in Melbourne when we were pretending we are in, in New York. But um, it was just a fun it, day out, just dressing up in sailor costumes and, you know, <laughs> hamming. It does up. look so much fun. It was fantastic. And nobody knew what we were doing. And, you know, I think in that last shot, there's this older woman in the background who's clapping, who just thought we were like laughing or something, which we just <laughs> last shot of the sketch. And it's completely sort of uh, impromptu and she just starts clapping like, yeah, like we were performing. I think she may have thought we were three sailors sort of dancing around Melbourne, enjoying ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Would it have been Santo doing a lot of the, the filming for these types yeah. of outdoor sketches? Uh, he did a lot of stuff. I don't know whether we used the ABC crew that day or not. I think anything like where we had to sort of run on and we didn't have necessarily have the right approvals or we couldn't afford to stick around for too long, Santo would just do it because it was quicker, you know. And um, he may have done that one. I can't remember who the crew were. But, yeah, Santo was great. He would just pick up a camera and we'd sort of just run around and do stuff, you know. Yeah, it's pretty amazing nowadays. You've just got everyone's got their mobile phones, but he had these little handy cam oh, and was able to just yeah. be really quick and agile and just go out there and film things. Yeah, and I, I remember it being a bit of a you know at the time because the ABC you know was heavily unionised. That the Santo or any of us filming stuff or doing technical things was a big deal because it was sort of stepping that line of performers and crew, you know. And so we were. For Santo to pick up a camera was like, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> so it was, a, it was a, quite a big deal at the ABC in terms of, I guess, for the first time, them dealing with people who were wanting to sort of edit themselves and film themselves and, you know, so there was a bit of friction with that. I remember when we were doing the show for the first time in terms of that line that was drawn in the sand in terms of, no, we, we're the crew, you know, if you want to have anybody film, it has to be the crew, but we were sort of, a lot more sort of, I guess, nim- we wanted to be a lot more nimble and, and, and quicker than that and do things where you could sort of come up with an idea and film it within an hour, you know? And that was the way you could do it with Santo. We just sort of say, let's do it, let's run out with the camera and um, and do it. So, yeah, I think these days, obviously, people are doing that themselves all the time. But back then it was a big mm. deal. We noticed that as we are watching season two, compared in length time, uh, season one was really pushing it to a full hour and then season two started becoming, you know, rounding down to the 50-minute mark. Was that harder to push any sketches out or to try and include them or anything but you limited to time? Because there are some episodes where you, you'll be reading up fan mail, um, but will that be 
kind of a fill up because it's a short time period or um, does it make sense? I don't know. Why, I can't remember why it was 50 minutes. I think we... I think we felt that we might have been a slightly shorter show it might have been a better show, you know, that 50 minutes might have been a better show to watch an hour. Um, and the case things wouldn't make it to air, like pre-recorded things that we'd drop on the run because we were running over time with some of the on-set pieces. But I would imagine it was because we felt 50 minutes was a better time to watch a show. Unless there was some weird programming thing with the ABC it was cutting to a 10 minute show about something, but uh, you know, I think a 50 minute show was just a quicker pace of show, you know. It sounded like you were, you were working basically six or seven days a week to make the late show, which I guess would be yeah. pretty intense. And did, did you, was that the reason that you didn't do a, a third series? Were you just exhausted by the end of the second series? Yeah, it was pretty frantic. And, um, but no, I think the, the reason in the end was that, I mean, you know, Tom, Rob and Santo, you know, they were sort of like a group that had sort of basically been working together for so long and, you know, since then obviously had all these successful shows and they were always of the few that should get out on top, you know, don't don't wear any ideas thin. And I, what we'd done 40 shows and I think they felt that was enough. I probably thought there was another season in us, you know, but I think... Um, we'd been working together, not just on the late show, but, you know, as a, as a group, you know, for a number of years before that. So I think those guys in particular felt it was time to move on and, and do, I think they did Frontline next. So, you know, so try something different, basically. But, yeah, there was probably another, I personally think there was probably another season in us, but um, those guys had decided to sort of move on and then, you know, other people had other ideas of doing I mean, it was either all in or, or not do it, really. I mean, it would have been too hard to... I think at one stage we had an idea in the early days that it was going to be... And, you know, if it worked, it would have been great. But, you know, we could have brought new people in and sort of like Saturday, Saturday Night Live where you sort of have an institution of a time slot on a Saturday night where new cast members come and old ones can leave, you know, but that sort of never happened. It was sort of an idea that we talked about in the early days. So did you feel a bit disappointed that there wasn't a, a third season? Uh, at the time, you know, it was kind of, I didn't, I guess I was disappointed. I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, I think once those guys made that decision, it wasn't even, it wasn't like the show was, ne- you know, it was like the decision had been made, so we sort of moved on. But personally, it was, I'd been in that group for, for quite a period of time, so... It was like, okay, what do we do next? You know, those guys obviously had a plan. I didn't have a plan. So it was like I had to quickly think about, okay, now what do I do? So it took me a while to sort of find my feet again in terms of, you know, I tried directing and uh, I basically ended up producing, which I love, and, you know, produce drama now. So I sort of I feel right. You know, it's, 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 you know, it just took me a while to sort of find my feet because, I mean, the best thing about being in a group is, is you know, working off each other and, and having that support around you. So... Yeah, I think I missed, I missed that. I was going to mention that you're, you're a very, very successful producer because currently you're running Lingo Pictures, correct? Yeah, yeah, I am. But I, I could rattle off, other than The King, you've rattled off, I could rattle off so many things. What would be, uh, like, you've, didn't you do The Choir of Hard Knocks as well? Yeah, I did The Choir of Hard Knocks, and uh, but under Lingo, you know, I've been doing... Uh, well, we're about to do a second season of Upright with Tim Minchin, which has been really successful for us. And um, we're doing a new BBC comedy with a, I can't say who it is yet, it hasn't been announced, but a big a UK comedy star coming out to Australia in February, who we're doing with her. Um, and Lambs of God was a drama I did produce, which, you know, was very successful. And, um, um, yeah, lot, lot, I've done lots of dramas over the years. And I think, you know, I sort of, I sort of almost got a bit sick of comedy because I've been doing sketch comedy for a long time and then I sort of fell into, well, I didn't fall into it. I sort of pursued it really, scripted drama, which I love. And, you know, things like working with Tim Minchin and other people, you know, I mean, it's a sort of dramedy, that show. So I do get to sort of flex a bit of a comedy muscle. But, um, yeah, scripted drama is, is, is my love now. Uh, you've also worked with uh, Sean McHale at uh, first on yeah. Topia and then later on with uh, Mr and Mrs Murder. Yeah, what yeah. Was that, what, what was that like working with Sean? 
Well, it was great because I hadn't, I didn't really know him. I mean, I sort of, I mean, everybody in the comedy business kind of knows each other, but Sean was one of those guys and I may have met him once, but I basically approached him and said, look, you know, there's a slot at SBS and looking for like a news, news type show. And I took him an idea and he quickly turned it into something else, which is fantastic and much better. But um, yeah, he was great to work with. I really enjoyed working with Sean. Um, you know, big brain, very rigorous in terms of his output. And um, yeah, I mean, lots of ways Newstopia was the precursor for the show he's doing on the ABC now. It's very similar. And then, yeah, he gets to sort of flex his um, his uh, dramatic chops a bit, um, yeah, with the other series, yeah. Yeah, well, I actually cast him in The King. Um, so he was cast in The King. He played, um, I can't remember the character's name. I think he was, well, the character was, you know, was, was running Channel 9 and he played a, uh, a role in that. Um, so I knew he could act and, um, yeah, we cast him in Mr. and Mrs. Murder, which... which um, was a fun show to do. Um, I don't think he's done much since then. He's been too busy doing his ABC show, I imagine. 2022 marks 30 years. Sorry to make it sound. Don't say that. No. Sorry. <laughs> it's reality. Okay, and it's, okay, 10 plus a couple. <laughs> so, now, um, a lot of fans, not just ourselves, but a lot because of the on social media and everything like that, they want to know, would there ever be a Late Show reunion of some sort, like it will be online or just like a special, kind of like, you know, what Hey Hey did really, like a, a flashback. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know, that's a bad example. I'm sorry. but <laughs> Like friends. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. We'll you said that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so but would, you, would you be uh, interested in having anything, like if it all the – moons and whatever stars aligned would it be something that you could possibly do like just a quick one hour to get together type thing and reflect on the past you mean like in this sort of forum where you talk about sketches or well, any type so, yeah so hell oh, we're happy to kind of co-host a you know a virtual oh, get together yeah. <laughs> i mean i couldn't imagine us performing old sketches i think they'd be quite sad and we'd all be going actually it wasn't that funny was it um <laughs> uh, i think that might be a bit i think that might be a bit tragic but you know i don't know i mean i i don't i, I you know it's quite enjoyable to look back on something you did 30 years ago and find people who are you know at least interested in, in what we did. So, um, yeah, I guess that's always an opportunity to, to look into, to sort of reminisce. Um, you know, I think we did a bit of that. I mean, it was much in the earlier days when we did those um, best songs where we sort of like did like a director's cup, you know, we'd have commentary over sketches. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you guys are sort of, you know, reliving it because... You probably, have, as I said, watched so many of the sketches more than we have. So uh, remember all those details. Except Tony Martin is he's a he's a stickler for detail. He'll remember all these sorts of things. You should have him on. He can answer all your questions about everything. Well, because you're on here, it might convince him to come on. I did ask at the very, very beginning when we first started, but now we're a little bit more polished, I think. So uh, I've got I've got an indirect connection. So I'll ask again and say. Jason told me to. Yeah. <laughs> he can do it. Yeah, a lot of the sketches and all that, while it may be, dare I say, a product of its time, it is... Yeah. We a, say that too much on this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we won't go into that, but it's, you know, it, at least it's a time to reflect, I guess, when you're of that particular age when you were watching it and it's good memories. Yeah. So it can... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, triggered... The hippocampus, I believe it would be. Oh, sorry. That well, was... I think it's about reliving your childhood, isn't it? Like I felt that way about, you know, other shows that I've watched and even the Hey Hey and Don Lane show that I used to watch, you know, being live TV and, you know, even when and Bert passed away this, this week, I felt a little sad because I think it's a bit of all of us die when, when something like that yeah. passed. So, and uh, I think also with COVID and lockdown that we've, I know, I don't know how other people felt, but I've always, it seems to sort of lean towards reminiscing more and looking back and, you know, we probably had more time on our hands to do that. But, um, yeah, I think it's a good thing to look back and remember. Yeah. Um, not necessarily like to bring in a 
you know, do a brand new show and with all bunch of sketches because that will be yeah. very, very difficult because you could do one thing and depending on the story or whatever, you say one thing and it'll be very, very sensitive or it'll be a, a social media outrage and then it's like, oh, you can't do anything right. So, <laughs> but, True. Yeah. So, um, but it'll be... You've got me, so you can start the ball rolling now. You've had one, so... Okay, now i just got to get Jane, Rob, Santo, Tom, <laughs> Tony, Mick, Seven to go. Judith, yeah. Seven to go, you know. Things pop up occasionally. I think my kids were excited last year because there was a late show, TikTok, of a sketch. That's, um, that's not us. <laughs> Oh, very excited, we're too old for TikTok now. Um I think it was the sketch where I don't know what it was called, but it's it, it's about like a game show. It's I'm not racist, but do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was one that we, we just we, we did that in the yeah, last episode. episode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we a TikTok during a, maybe Australia Day celebrations were in, in, in the context of, you know, should we be celebrating Australia Day and the racism around that? I think, oh, no, it might have been Black Lives Matter. There was some connection to to it and somebody had, had taken that sketch and used it as I'm not racist but in terms of, you know, talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, which was great. It's being used in a good way. But, um, yeah, my kids said, oh, Dad, you're on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds good. The uh, ultimate accolade. Yeah, certainly they were interested in my career for the first time, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I've, there's been a few sort of memes and things like that popped up. Which you can't, ex- you know, I mean, these days, things like that. You can't escape it in a good way. We started this podcast because there is that audience out there who just like to reminisce and that there are yeah. more obsessed people than us, to be honest. But, <laughs> you know, th- th- there's stuff that it's like, okay, there's obsession and then there's stalkerish. So <laughs> but they all mean well, but it's it's just amazing that um, when we do get the odd private message or quote or whatever, there's people who mm-hmm. quote this more or more obscure stuff than we do. And, it, like, how does it feel the fact that people can just – bring up anything on call and you'll just be dumbfounded that um, you just go, how do you remember that? But we only know that because we're watching it at the moment. So I know I was feel a bit guilty that I don't remember as much as they do. It's like, you know, I feel like, you know, I do feel a bit guilty when people ask me questions, go, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, but, um, oh, it's, it's lovely. You know, I mean, I, it's, I mean, the thing about, you know, I guess, being recognised, and it doesn't happen to me much these days, but when, you know, with the late show, when we're on air, you know, people would come up to you and I can't remember a bad experience because people were, you know, we'd make people laugh or, or enjoy that night and or reminisce and, you know, people always come up with a smile on their face. So, you know, um, I can't, yeah, I can't remember a bad experience of that. And it's, it's happened, you know, Traveling around the world, or in the least expected places, where people will come up and go, "Are you, are you that guy? Are you Jason Stevens?" <laughs> yeah. So or, you're yeah. overseas in Europe trying to enjoy a nice dinner, and you just ask yeah. oh, for your autograph. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember once when I when I left the late show, I went to New York for for some time to, to do a film school course over there, and I was in a theater, like a cinema, and uh, an Australian guy recognized me. He said, "Where's Mick?" <laughs> I'm in New York and he's asking me he's like I don't know <laughs> you, you mean you're not permanently welded together exactly <laughs> um, people just go up to you and go hey Graham and the Colonel Graham and the Colonel and you'll be like yeah that's great but I'm not part of Graham nor the Colonel <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it would be muck raking or, or you know one of the sketches I've done yeah but were you involved in writing some of the other segments as well? Because uh, obviously we don't know exactly who wrote what. And you mentioned you wrote the Sharp song. And yeah. are there any interesting sketches that you might have been behind that we might not have imagined you were behind? Um, no, I guess the sketches. No, there'd be things like, you know, musical mix-ups where they go, okay, this is the concept. What do you, I remember coming out with uh, Shirley Bassey, Ron Barassi, that sort of, you know, so we'd all just throw it out and come up with things. So that was an example of. You know, having enough, somebody had the idea. I can't remember who it was, and then we go, "Okay, we need some some names that sound like each other." Um, yeah, but you know, things like hands off, I wrote, and things I was in, I you know, 
I wrote dinner party sketch. I think I think Tom and Rob wrote most of those as Santo, but we'd all be in it. You know, they were fun. They were fun sketches. Um, but Grand Colonel, you know, there's obviously Tom and and sorry, uh, Rob and Santo, um, and Mick and Rob wrote shit scared. Um, you pretty much, if you were in it, you wrote it or had something to do with it, other than the big sort of ensemble pieces like Dinner Party or, you know, that Viking sketch. I think Tony wrote that from memory. Did you do anything with Paradise Beach? Hey, Warner Brothers Movie World. Yeah, I think we wrote that. I think there was, was it a muckraking sketch. No, it was just a regular synopsis, like just a standalone sketch because Paradise Beach had just started on TV. Oh, right. That was in the first season? Yeah, oh, no, second season. It was the very start of the second season. Yeah, I can't remember. Very very, very first episode of season two. Gee, <laughs> we'd had that big break and that's what we came up with. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, um, I can't recall. I can't recall that one. We don't expect you to remember. As we've said, we've been only recently re-watching these. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> when, I, when we were teenagers, we had... This is quite nerdy, but we had a little late show book where we would just write little little anecdotes and pass them around in class. But uh, one oh. thing that my, my friends and I noticed was that you were the butt of quite a few jokes. And <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional or not, but, for example, in Viking Talk, you got beheaded. Yes. And um, in the musical of Tom's Day, you were told to rack off. There yes. was You um, got cut off while singing Xanadu in the Yothu Yindi sketch. Um, everyone hated you as Christopher in the Christopher Columbus. Was this intentional? No, no. no. <laughs> I think you were overanalyzing it. <laughs> that is a conspiracy theory that uh, doesn't hold up. But uh, yeah, no, I don't think it was intentional. But um, now that you mention it, maybe I should go back and revisit it. <laughs> I can supply you my tapes if you want. <laughs> I think it was a running gag where Tom would hit me over the head or something. I just. Uh, I think there may have been. Did we do a sketch where we sort of went back to see how often Tom would hit me on the head? Or that would, no, I'm just making that up. <laughs> um, but what you mentioned, no, I don't. I'm, there was certainly nothing scripted to to, uh, to do with that. I don't think there was one sketch where uh, you basically rapped about things you wanted to see on TV. Oh yeah. Vizard's head blew up on air, Ramsey Street made a thoroughfare, George yeah. Negus bungee jump, bouncer from neighbours take a dump. Uh, basically, what, 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 what would you want to uh, see on TV these days? Surely, surely it's changed in the intervening time. I don't know. I think TV is like this. For me, there's no such thing as TV like it was. I think it's completely different. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think TV is kind of, unfortunately, I think it's, you know, the TV that we grew up is very much gone, I think, in lots of ways. You know, um, I think, you know, it's, it's streaming and it's, it's a live television. is is difficult at the best of times. But um, I don't know. I think our show was of the time. But I think to try and replicate that or try and make it happen again, not, not that you're suggesting that, but I think, um, I think that was the – it was just that sort of zeitgeisty thing of, you know, us and the timing and – ABC and live TV that sort of made it work. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're right about there being, well, yeah, there's a lot more TV these days. I mean, yeah, it was only five channels back then, but, I yeah. mean, yeah, all the, all, the, all the digital stuff plus subscription plus streaming. Yes, and audiences are so fragmented now. You know, we, I mean, back then it was like, I, I don't know how many viewers we were getting, but it would have been over a million, at least a million viewers, and then, um, did they replay it the next day, or am I imagining that? Was it replay? Yeah, they did. It was on yeah. Sunday nights. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there was, I mean, you know, it was just that everybody would, you don't even have, you had so many choices. So, but now, you know, with the, you know, as I said, everything's fragmented. It's hard to get, I mean, obviously there's drama series that do this, but in terms of live TV, it's very hard to get everybody to watch at the one time, I think. Mm. I think you're right. The, the definitely, it definitely feels like shows like The Late Show don't really exist anymore. I mean, SNL's no. probably one of the few that that's still going. But yeah. th- those those kind of shows where you feel like anything can happen and probably will, and and it's and there's that tension, there's that excitement that you feel from from live TV. It, it doesn't exist anymore, which is a shame. But yeah. but yeah, that's because the audience are all watching Netflix or or whatever now. 
it's yeah, just I different. Think, I think yeah. the modern day alternative is, uh, is someone does a stand up show live and records it, and that goes on Netflix. So it's <laughs> that's almost <laughs> like what, what you're seeing. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. I think it still happens, but it's a, it, it's a longer tail, so it takes a lot longer for people to sort of for a community to, to exist around it or, you know, for, for catchphrases to exist and that sort of thing. So, I mean, ours was so instant. You do something the next day, we're talk, people were talking about it in, you know, in the schoolyard, whereas now I think it takes a while for people to watch something and for that groundswell to happen. Um, but yeah. Like while everyone's doing their own thing, do you yeah. okay, do you still hang out with each other, like uh, I guess at those regular conferences or uh, functions, awards nights or whatever, but... Um, when it's you know off work, when you're clocked off, do you, would you yeah. go over and have catch ups dinner or stuff like that? Oh, during the sh- during the se- during the recording oh, no, of the show. No, 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 like today, today. Oh, today, not no, not really. Because we live, I live in Sydney. I've been living in Sydney for the last eleven years, um, and uh, I mean, I saw about I think it was last year. I saw Rob and Santo and Jane and Mick at a function, and that was great to catch up with them. But um, yeah, no, we don't. We don't sort of hang out, um, and I don't see them very often. But when we do, you know, I was, I was texting Rob the other week because our, our AFL teams were playing against each other, so I was texting him, wishing him the best of luck. But that's you know, it's that sort of extent of of seeing each other. But uh, when we do, you know, it's like that thing of I guess growing up together. You sort of you reconnect, and you know, there were such formative years, and you. you you know, in your twenties, you create. You guys would know this. You know, if you went to university or, or work colleagues from your twenty and friendships, they sort of they sort of stick. So yeah. when you see each other, it's really it's great. You know, because you sort of just revert back to that those times pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, I think we. I mean, I can't speak for them, but I think it was a time in our lives where we were sort of you know in our twenties, and it was very exciting. You know, to be able to make to be given the opportunity and freedom to make stuff every Saturday night. Um, yeah, it was just that opportunity that people said, you know, off you go and do it, you know. So it was, a, you know, I guess a once-in-a-lifetime thing really to do it as a group live around Australia. And there was some other good thing about the ABC was it, went, it was broadcast everywhere around Australia. So when you travel to places like, you know, Darwin or, you know, Western Australia, people had seen the show, you know, because the ABC, you know, in some towns in, in Australia, that was the only sort of network that received. So your show was the, the one that watched, so that was great. What What would your advice be for someone who wants to get into the industry nowadays with it being so fragmented? It isn't all about quantity or how many people are watching. It's more about, you know, the, the quality of what you're watching, who you're targeting, all that sort of thing. What's your advice to someone hoping to get into the industry? Well, I think it's always, you know, if you can find somebody to do it with, it's so much more enjoyable because it's, it's, it's a tough industry. And uh, if you can find a buddy or, you know, friends to do it with, it's going to be a, a much more enjoyable ride, especially, you know, f- for the times where it feels too hard. So that would be my, th- I think it's really difficult by yourself. Um, personally, I, I always enjoyed working with people, but, you know, I think these days it's a lot easier to be discovered because, you know, you can kind of post things and, you know, there's obviously a lot of successful comedians or performers who have got their own niche and are doing really well, you know. And um, so it's through exposure, through social media and obviously the internet these days, it's, if you're good enough, it's it's probably, you know, talent will get you there eventually. But, um, yeah, personally, I just think it's, you know, just a lot easier to do it with somebody that you, you like working with. Yeah, who, who was the most popular? Who, who got the most fan mail? That... Oh, Mick, by far. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And what did he do? Did he read out his favourites? <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. He just he would just get a lot of fan mail. I think, you know, people just loved him. They, and they, as they do today, you know. Um, yeah, he would, he would get the most fan mail. Like you've got your muck raking, you've got your other oh. sketches and bits and pieces. Like what, what mm-hmm. would you like the late show to be remembered for as like uh, just a – really chilled Saturday night comedy show where you threw sketches together that were topical and people like us are over analyzing something that's just <laughs> basic or uh, just like, cause you could say it, it's on par with, I guess, Australia's Monty Python where it's that iconic and the fact that you can't get the episodes of, and when you yeah. we're watching through it all, we realize, yeah, you can't 
really release it because there's stuff that's really uh, dated. But what would you like to, for the show to be remembered for? Like just something to laugh or? Yeah, well, I think your summary sort of was good, but I, I think I think it was the stuff that was happening between the sketches. You know, I think it was that sort of I don't know how you describe it, but it was that sort of magic that sometimes shows have in terms of that particular group of people at that particular group at you know, that time, and how we sort of you know I think how we worked together and how we sort of you know basically came together and and, and created this this show, and then sometimes there is you know, magic around things. And I think it's it's a whole heap of things coming together at the same time and pretty hard to describe, but it obviously worked. Uh, it worked, you know, and who knows why. But, um, yeah, I think that's, it's the sort of probably that sort of, the fact that it's still being remembered and talked about is, is pretty cool. So I don't know what you call that, but it, it did resonate with some sketch shows that might have been funnier, but they've sort of come and gone where this is stuck around. So I don't know, maybe you guys can answer that question better than I can, why people still enjoy enjoy talking about it. But I, I think it's that combination of people, you know. Well, I, if that was an actual question that we could answer, um, I, I guess I remember it because it reminds me of something which kind of developed my sense of humour. Because yeah, it was it was that because at the time I was 12, um, yeah. 13, and that's when things are starting to kick in of yeah. well, what taste, what style, and I I got it. I just connected with the sense of humour um, and the style of comedy that you guys were producing. And yeah, that, that's, that's for me yeah. anyway. Yeah, I think your show had a, a had a very distinctive point of view. You know, that was a, it was sort of a point of view that came about through all of us sort of being on the same page about how we saw the world at that time in our lives. So I think that was quite focused and I think people did respond to that in terms of, yeah, can't put it more simply than how we saw the world and our point of view of, you know, being irreverent and sort of having a laugh of, at things, you know, and had people sort of, um, yeah, I guess people felt that they were on the same page as us, you know. Mm. I know that's a bit serious an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you're meant to wrap up a podcast or an interview thing yeah. where you've oh got to go God. with a real serious question? No, it's the end of the fart joke or something, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. can, can you just dub in a fart joke there, Matt? Yeah. yeah. I'll... <laughs> dub, dub in a massive fart or something. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we had season two, episode one, we had uh, Justin Anderson, um, the, your, the Piss Week kid, uh, Full Hardy, yeah. Cousin George. He did yeah. a full thing and, yeah, as I said, we had – Piffy as well, and um, yeah, we're yeah. trying to just get as many names on board. Yeah, um, yeah, whether they're fans or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Piss Week kids. I mean, that was one sketch I never saw. I never met those kids, and it was Tom would go and do that with. Um, I think Santo was filming it, so that was one of those examples of sketches where people just splinter off and do their own thing. Mm. So I'd see that sketch for the first time on that night, which is pretty cool. That's mm. awesome. So I've never, I've never met the Piss Week kids. And what about the whole champagne comedy thing? Well, that was Rob's, uh, I think that came about because I think Rob felt that there was a sketch that wasn't going to work very well um, and that he had it up his sleeve in terms of coming on and sort of trying to save the sketch by saying, being sarcastic about it, being unfunny by saying champagne comedy which was often, you know, often we'd make ourselves laugh if things weren't working as well as we thought they would. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's why we liked it as well. When things just didn't go quite to plan, that yeah. actually made it yeah. much more funny. Well, that was the thing. When things didn't work, the rest of the cast took great delight in, you know, enjoying the sort of pain of watching our sketches. <laughs> <laughs> things was not working as well as they should have. That was our safety net. But, yeah, champagne comedy came about from that very, uh, through that very reason of, Rob sort of, you know, basically playing up how something didn't work as well as it should have. Do you have, did you, did you keep any props? Uh, no, I didn't keep in, I had the, no, I didn't know they, they were, I did had some, I had some Edward Scissorhands hands that. <gasps> From the Psycho Pass. Oh. Yeah, but yeah. I think they, I lost them years ago. Oh. Um, well, any scripts? Do you have any uh, scripts? Because everything oh, yeah. would have been written out on paper and stuff. Yeah, but lots of scripts. Because Mick and I used to handwrite scripts. So, um, you know, I think 
laptops were just coming in. So Mick and I would hand write muckraking scripts at his house. So I've probably got those somewhere. Scan them or sell them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Publish a book on them. Yeah, like, uh, you can do it. If Sean McAuliffe can do it with all his full frontal mad as hell stuff, I would say. You oh, yeah, I've yeah, no, put them somewhere, but uh, I don't think I threw them out. I don't know. Don't throw something. them out. No, <laughs> send, no. send them to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> send them to us, scan in, and then we'll publish it in courtesy of you. So yeah, right, yeah. I'll see just you. to show that, you know, the love is still there. And you'll be surprised how many people will love it. Like you, you see it as a piece of paper with fart joke written on it, but to <laughs> everyone else it is... We oh see God, it as that... a milestone of Australian television history. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, wow. yeah. Just like the, the, fake, the fake letters that people used to write in. <laughs> yeah. We're, we've been dissecting those and I, I might have been overdoing it and I'm going, it might have been a real letter, but it's been rewritten by, say, oh, I recognise Tony's handwriting or Jane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Can, can, I just, can I just point out that I wrote a letter to the late show which was read out on air by you, Jason Stevens. Oh, no way. Yeah. And, and so there, and that's the next episode that we're going to cover when we come back yeah. next year has got my letter told, in it. I wish you told me that earlier in this uh, podcast. That's quite <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. Really. You're, you're probably the only one who actually wrote a real that's letter. Really <laughs> so you'll say, oh, come on, there must have been at least several others. But, yeah, my, my real letter was read out on air by you, Jason. What was it about? What did the letter say? Well, do you remember you were doing late show lookalikes and I found a, a lookalike for Tony. And yes. it was an ad, basically, of a sort of um, claymation figure. Oh, and and th this claymation figure was advertising a sort of like a, you know, a cold and flu type medication. Yes, and the claymation I, figure had like a, it was like a saw, like a wooden saw that was running through the neck. Yeah. And so they, they got Tony to stand there with a saw behind him <laughs> to try and replicate <laughs> this. Thank you. Did it get a laugh? Um, s sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't care because I was going, oh my God, my letter's been run, read out. <laughs> but did you, sorry, Alice, did you watch that live when, when you saw that happening? Yeah. And you I, were I, screaming? I, uh, yeah, pretty much. And then immediately the phone rings and it's a friend of mine going, oh my God, they read out your letter. And I'm like, yes, they did. Now go away. I want to watch the rest of the late show. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. That yeah. was great when people would send stuff in like that because, yeah, we were, they were doing all the hard work for us. There was one thing as well, um, which, Daniel, I think you might have asked about this, the obsession with on the buses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was, oh. was driven by Tony, and then he found out that I could do quite a good Blakey impersonation. Can you right now? Yeah, there was there was, <laughs> yeah, there, there was, there was some sort of weird um, running gag during one episode where uh, Mick was wanting everybody to... Yeah, do do a, a Blakey impression, uh, and if if everybody did, he would uh, he would sing Bette Midler's "The Rose" the next episode. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I don't know why. I think he was obsessed with that. No, I think it was, uh, Tony. Um, I think Tony and I shared a, a common interest in on the buses, and um, yeah, um, I, mean, I, I can't recall. I think I may have done a Blakey impersonation on the show in one of the episodes. Yeah, you did in mm. season one. It was right at the very end. And the throwaway sort of gag. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> no, right, no pressure. Sorry. I I since then, I don't think. <laughs> I'm not about to do it today. No, nah, all good. <laughs> hey, you've done enough for us already by coming on here, and I don't want you hanging up on us. So <laughs> it's like this interview is over. Why? Because it was, oh, we asked for a flaky impression. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we're exhausted from that. That was a really long yeah. conversation, which I think we may have came off as obsessive, but I am sorry, yeah. Jason. <laughs> in in a good way, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, of course. Now, honestly, well, so we, we, got, we, got, we got feedback once saying that, that we, we go through these episodes in forensic detail, and that's certainly what we've done with this interview. I think we've been very forensic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone out there wants to go into this, well, hopefully Jason has answered all your questions. He's answered a lot of ours. So um, and other than the fact that, no, there won't be a full episode release of The Late Show for obvious reasons if you've been listening to the podcast. But I just want to say thank you so, so much, Jason, for coming on. Um, yeah. Can't, can't thank you enough, honestly. That's a pleasure, guys, and it's great to meet uh, people who are so enthusiastic about The Late Show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's it's a euphemism. I can. Thanks for doing all the hard work of uh, Recall, and uh, it was lovely to speak to you all.
Cool. Is there anything you'd like to plug? No, I have nothing to plug. Nothing at all. Um, Yeah, but thanks for having me. That's okay. All right, well, that wraps up for the special edition of the Champagne Comedy Podcast. My name is Matt, and I just want to say thank you for Alison, Daniel, uh, Kim, Prue, and Tony, who are usually part of this whole thing, but we've got Kim, Alison, and Daniel here. So thank you so much, guys, for staying on, having a chat, and there we go. Hope we nerded out a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) All good. All right, so feel free to send us feedback. Email champagnelateshow at gmail.com. Twitter at TLS Champagne and also our website, champagnecomedy.com. Facebook, The Late Show page or the Champagne Comedy Podcast group on Facebook. It's on private, but I answer three questions and you're in. And also, oh God, it could just go on and on. Anyway, it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Have a good night, everyone, and catch you in our new Bye-bye. season coming soon. Thanks. <laughs> See you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Champagne Comedy Podcast, created by fans for the fans. For more information on this podcast, please visit champagnecomedy.com. Produced by Matt Fulton Productions, mattfulton.com.au.